I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here to talk to you about TDEs and especially optical polarization observation, which were uh, rather surprising and also very puzzling um, observations that we had for one particular source. So this work was done in uh, our group in Finca when I was part of it. Um, that was last year. Uh, and the beginning of this year, I, I transferred Move a little bit further. Transfer to uh, Anthony, uh, Trondheim, Norway, in the group of Manuel Linares. And uh, Manu is going to give a talk this afternoon, so you all get to meet him uh, remotely. Um, and unfortunately, I cannot give you reference uh, yet for, yeah, for this work because. Uh, while it has been accepted for publication in science, uh, it has still not been published. Um, and it was already accepted in, uh, in last year, so I, I don't know, maybe the editor is trying to make a world record <laughs> sitting on a paper or something. Okay, uh, so the last um, two speakers gave a nice introduction to CDE, so I think we are all on the same page. Um, so I, don't, I can skip my introduction if I can get this to work. Okay. Somehow it's super slow. So I will skip here. So what Tom was saying about sort of the normal TD is probably actually not normal, what was thought about uh, at the beginning or by Martin Rees and um, co-authors. Uh, what they thought that uh, when the star gets disrupted, uh, it quickly cir circulates around the black hole and forms an accretion disk. And then we sort of immediately see the X-ray emission coming from the accretion disk. And this is actually what was observed first in, uh, in papers by Gomosa et al. In, in the early 2000s. That indeed there are these sources that uh, come up in X-rays and then they have a decay which is very particular for tidal disruption events. Uh, uh, as the flux goes to the time to the power of minus five thirds. Uh, and this comes from the, the mass fallback rate uh, from the stellar debris. So this was sort of the, sort of the first th thought of uh, a tidal disruption event. And then it was sort of surprising um, when we go back to the work of Suvi Gezari et al. in 2012, that they found these optical TDEs, um, where we see the optical light curve uh, mimicking the one in the X-rays, basically. So we have a rise in the optical, and then we have this uh, um, characteristic decay uh, of the light curve. And th these were happening at the galaxy centers, so there were nuclear sources, um, and not likely to be an HEN activity uh, and probably not uh, supernovae either because the decays were very long. Uh, the only problem with these optical TDEs was that these didn't have any X-ray counterparts um, and they, they were relatively cooler uh, and also their, um, if you fit the black body models to this data you get the regions that are much more larger than what we could expect from accretion disk emission. So this was sort of a puzzle that uh, uh, what's going on with these optical TDEs. And then uh, quickly pe well, people are clever and they found out that these systems are really messy. So this is a picture from a simulation uh, by Kilokron et al. from 2014 uh, showing that there's a lot of matter around the black hole and a lot of matter around the uh, the accretion disk. So this matter can reproduce the X-ray emissions uh, to optical and then therefore we get the only optical TDEs which are actually reprodu uh, processed emission from the accretion disk itself. Um, at the same time there were theoretical and, and simulation work uh, studying more closely what happens to the stellar matter at the very center of, the, um, of its orbit, uh, close to the black hole. And they found out that 
actually, while it forms a shock and, and it dissipates uh, the orbital energy of the, of the flow, it doesn't dissipate enough to circularize the flow really quickly and to start forming the X-rays. Rather, the flow curves back further out um, and collides to itself, producing shock emission. And presumably, this shock emission um, is strong enough to produce all the uh, optical emission, or this was the con conclusions of uh, Viran et al. in 2015 paper. So maybe these uh, optical TDEs are, are these type of uh, shock um, powered uh, tidal disruption events. So how do we know what is going on? Uh, can we somehow distinguish between the, these different scenarios, whether it's reprocessing, uh, which is very likely to happen, or whether it's uh, shock emission? And not surprisingly, we can do it with polarization. Um, so he here, I go through the, our observations, which were done with the uh, uh, Ropopol instrument in Skinakas Observatory, and also at the knot with the Alfosk. Uh, and at the upper panel here, you see the uh, optical light curve, so it's a very regular, ordinary TDE. Um, and in the middle panel, um, is the polarization decree. So at the lower part of the panel is the, the polarization we observe, but as, as we know that the, these things are embedded in the center of the galaxies, we need to correct for the unpolarized light coming from the galaxy itself. So when we corrected our polarization decre decrease uh, for the host galaxy um, light, uh, we get up to 25% uh, of intrinsic polarization. And this is something really, really high value of polarization. Um, and we also had uh, uh, a change in the polarization angle. So it started somewhere uh, close to, I probably can, cannot see, but minus 10, and then went to minus um, 40. So it was also rotating at the same time. OK, so then, then we had this huge linear polarization. So we're thinking that, okay, where it can come from. And of course, it's really high degree polarization. It's hard to produce with it. basically any other astrophysical mechanism apart from synchrotron radiation. And therefore, we realized that, okay, maybe it has a jet. So these TDEs, as we heard from Tom, uh, sometimes have jets. I mean, it's rare. It's about 1%, but, but no, it could be, be, be the case. So we had some VLA observations. Uh, from this source, uh, and first it was not uh, detected in the 15 gigahertz, um, which is something like um, uh, a few few weeks uh, from the peak, uh, showing this uh, red dot. This is actually the, the plot is a collection of all known um, uh, radio emission from TDEs, showing that we can f sort of form two different categories. Either they are very radio loud, uh, probably the jet is pointing towards us, uh, or they are radio quiet. So either the emission is coming from, uh, not from the jet, from star formation, or then the jet is uh, uh, coming on only later, like in the case of Assassin 15OI. Um, or then, this possibly can be off-axis jet, so we are not seeing jet uh, head-on. Uh, so back to the, to the VLA observation from, from, from our source. Um, uh, we detected the source then uh, later on uh, with the so really soft uh, frequencies, so 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, but this uh, value is very low. It's sort of the lowest uh, ones from these radio quiet uh, TDEs. And we can actually fit um, this with the, just the star formation. So it probably comes just from the galaxy and not from the TDE itself. We checked also the, um, the X-rays because um, as we saw from, uh, from uh, Yanis's talk that uh, these jets can also produce X-rays. 
Um, and we had, uh, first we have some sweet observations, but the angular resolution is kind of bad. There was some, some signal hints there. And then we applied for XMM time. And we saw that there is actually source very close by, but it doesn't match uh, the location of the CD. So we didn't find any, any X-ray emissions either um, up to like uh, 200 days. So possibly also the accretion disk uh, and not the jet uh, hasn't formed yet. Um, of course, we can have polariza linear polarization from uh, reprocessing as well, um, and also from the accretion disk. And depending on the inclination, if the inclination is uh, maximally edge on, we can have 11.7% uh, linear polarization from the disk. Uh, and also from the stellar debris disk, if it's uh, clumpy, uh, we can produce maybe 10% of linear polarization. But either uh, of these cannot, cannot really explain uh, the full 25% of polarization. And also all of these CD reprocessing models really require some sort of quasi-spherical geometry. And these, uh, because it's spherical or quasi-spherical, um, these are low polarized to the sym uh, symmetry. And also the reprocessing uh, produces um, spectral lines um, uh, and also late radio and X-ray emission, which we didn't uh, observe up to date. Okay, so going back to the colliding stellar stream shocks. Uh, so the, this is the model from uh, Yogawa et al. Uh, showing that the uh, disintegration rate from the shocks first rises uh, during the optical rise uh, because of the shock number one, so the pericenter shock here. Uh, and then it sort of levels off. Um, and there is a change uh, between the uh, contributions from different shocks. Uh, so the, the, the stellar stream shocks uh, further out from the black hole starts to dominate um, the uh, dissipation rate. Um, and so we were thinking that uh, these lines here mark the sort of the phases where the different shocks uh, start to dominate. Uh, and at first the polarization is very low, or not very low, but uh, on the low side, uh, less than 10%. Uh, and that emission is then produced at the the shock number one. And when these uh, um, stellar stream shocks uh, begin to dominate, we get the bump uh, in the polarization decree, and we go get also the change in the polarization angle. Um, and then slowly the, the shock diminishes, and then we get the decay in the uh, polarization decree. So this sor sort of works, but of course this um, needs proper modeling uh, to, uh, to make sure that we, we have strong enough shocks um, there and uh, the optical depths are not too high so as to scatter all the signal away. Um, so to conclude, colliding stellar stream shocks seem to be currently the only viable scenario for explaining these observations. Uh, they too, um, we didn't figure out any any other scenario. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the simulations are very difficult for TDs because these are large systems, so you need to take into account um, uh, different, um, uh, different distances uh, in the simulations. And uh, typically, uh, the simulations that have been done uh, doesn't include magnetic fields, so therefore they cannot include polarized radiation. Although in, in some works by Bonnerot et al. in 2017 show that the stellar magnetic field is expected to be amplified a lot uh, in the stellar stream shocks. So the shocks uh, definitely can be powerful enough to produce um, uh, the synchrotron emission uh, and be polarized uh, up to 20%. Of course, this is statistics of the plan at the moment. Uh, so we are desperately looking for more observations and hopefully uh, 
we can do this with not uh, at least for the next couple of years and hopefully then with the NT as well. So I will end here. Thank you and I will take questions.